Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's webinar. My name is Natalie Arbaugh, and today Tom Frangillo, Caroline Simmons, and I will present Beyond the Basics, Understanding and Maximizing Enforcement of Your Trade Secrets in the Global Age. Today's webinar will run for about an hour. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We will do our best to answer those questions time permitting. We might answer some of those questions throughout the presentation, and in any event, we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. Please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if you prefer. Before we get started, I should remind you that the content of the presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson, and of course is also not intended to address every court or case situation. So with that said, we'll start with Beyond the Basics, Understanding and Maximizing Enforcement of Your Trade Secrets in the Global Age. And we'll start with the Defend Trade Secrets Act, the long-awaited Defend Trade Secrets Act. And why do I say long-awaited? Well, for those of you who have kept up with it, it's gone through um, several um, stops and starts over the past few years. It, there were times when we thought it was going to get passed and it didn't, and times when we thought it would never happen, and it's finally here, and so many practitioners practitioners are very happy that it's finally been signed into law. The Defend Trade Secrets Act is an extension of the Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which we'll also touch on later in the presentation today. So what does it do? Well, its stated purpose is to create a federal private right of action, specifically to allow trade secret owners to protect their innovations by seeking redress in federal court which would allow them to bring their rights into alignment with those long enjoyed by owners of other forms of intellectual property. So that's the stated purpose. And there's also the hope that the federal uh, cause of action will help create uniformity among the interpretation of trade secret misappropriation laws throughout the country. Up until now, it's been comprised solely of state court laws um, and p sort of patchwork state court laws. And while the Uniform Trade Secrets Act and um, 48 model uniform acts have been um, implemented by those states, there's been some uniformity that's been created as a result, but also on certain issues, there still remains lack of uniformity because, of course, when states interpret their new statutes, including their uniform acts, they also look at their common law that existed prior to that time. So it remains to be seen exactly how the federal cause of action will impact that, but certainly there are many who hope that it will add to the uniformity across the board for enforcement. And a key point is that it's very broad. Um, it seeks to provide relief for misappropriation of a trade secret that's related to a product or service used in or intended for use in not just interstate commerce, but also foreign commerce. So at a high level, what we'll cover today um, are the definitions of a trade secret and improper means. We'll just touch on that quickly. Um, whether there's preemption, the remedies, including the new civil seizure provision, whistleblower provisions, and um, the statement regarding the biannual report on foreign theft. Briefly, I'll touch on the first two of those points. Um, first of all, with regard to the definitions of trade secret and improper means, it's just worth noting that these definitions are generally consistent with other uniform acts that are out there in the states already. So there's not anything that's particularly significant um, on the definition of trade secret, for example. It's defined very broadly, um, very consistent with how the, the Uniform Model Act uh, defines trade secret. And it's going to cover all range of information, including technical and non-technical business information. Additionally, the statute adopts the concept or the paradigm of what I'll call the improper means paradigm for what is it to constitute a misappropriation specifically. And when I say uh, improper means, essentially that means that someone has acquired a trade secret um, of another and they, they have reason to know that it was acquired by improper means or they disclose or use the trade secret without express or implied consent to do so. Um, which includes using improper means to acquire the trade secret. 
And so those general concepts of the Defend Trade Secret Act are not something particularly novel or any kind of divergence from other laws that are out there. The Act also specifically makes clear that it does not preempt other state court laws. So importantly, this means that the avenue remains open to those of you who would like to enforce your trade secrets to choose pursuing under the Defend Trade Secrets Act in federal court or also pursuing your claims in state court as you've always been able to do. So let's talk about the remedies. So in general, um, but not across the board, I would say that the remedies provision of the Defend Trade Secrets Act also is fairly consistent with what we see and have seen for years in, in the laws of the states um, enforcing trade secrets. First, a trade secret owner can seek damages for actual loss, loss suffered as a result of the misappropriation. The trade secret owner can additionally seek damages for unjust enrichment to the extent that those damages are not already addressed or accounted for by the actual loss component. Additionally, the statute provides for the option of obtaining a reasonable royalty, which uh, has pretty much always been an option in the trade secret context. And the statute provides for two times the actual damages awarded in addition to the damages awarded. So essentially treble damages for willful misappropriation. So what does it say on injunctive relief? This is a very interesting part of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. I think it's a provision in particular that's going to lead to a lot of jurisprudence and likely conflicting or confusing jurisprudence, at least in the short term when courts figure out how to interpret this. And I'll get into in a minute why I think that is. But the statute does allow for the court to award injunctive relief to prevent actual or importantly, quote, threatened misappropriation. But, and this is key, the court cannot prevent a person from entering into an employment relationship. And condition, conditions placed on employment shall be based on evidence of threat and misappropriation and not merely on the information the person knows. Um, the statute also states in this section that the court's order cannot conflict with applicable state law uh, prohibiting restraints on, restraints on trade, i.e. non-competes, for example. And so there's a real big question here of what does this mean and how, all of, how is all of this going to shake out? And for example, the, the concept of threatened misappropriation. So that brings into play how does this statute affect the doctrine of probable or inevitable disclosure? Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with that doctrine, that is the doctrine that some states have recognized that allows a trade secret owner to obtain adjunctive relief when direct evidence of use or disclosure of a trade secret is not in existence, but you prove through a myriad of facts that the employee is likely or inevitably going to disclose your trade secrets and therefore an injunction results. And oftentimes it results prohibiting the employee for t from taking a similar position at their new employer. And so a, a big question mark is how is this part of the statute going to shake out on that issue in particularly? Because on the one hand, it's clear that the statute's enabling the court to provide injunctive relief for threatened misappropriation. Now, on the other hand, it's, it's stating, it's clearly indicating um, that, that Congress is concerned with employee mobility by stating that the court cannot prevent a person from entering into an employment relationship and um, whether, whether as a practical matter or otherwise, inevitable disclosure injunctions often do that. So if it allows uh, an injunction prohibiting threat and misappropriation, but at the same time that can occur, what does that mean and how all that is going to shake out? And that remains to be seen. Um, on the one hand, uh, the you know many states interpret threat and misappropriation to directly speak to the concept of inevitable disclosure and, and directly allow uh, that doctrine. Some states have specifically stated that threaten doesn't necessarily mean that, and there's and there's some positions in between, frankly. Um, so the employee the 
the provision on the fact that the order cannot prevent a person from entering into employment relationship will be heavily litigated, and I think it will be pointed out in a lot of requests, particularly in the inevitable or probable disclosure doctrine, because that provision, as this was working its way through Congress, is a key provision that was inserted into the statute that enabled certain members of Congress to get on board with the statute. So it is going to be a key provision, and we're going to have to wait to see how courts walk this balance. And when you look at the fact that it states that conditions placed on such employment shall be based on evidence of threat and misappropriation and not merely on the information the person knows, well, frankly, that uh, in and of itself, I don't know how much that gets us or tells us because that's how we prove inevitable or probable disclosure in many departing employee cases. And so where is the line and, and how are the courts going to be able to draw those lines to both protect for threatened misappropriation and protect the employee mobility issues that Congress clearly want to um, protect. So that's a big question. And then separate and apart from that, because it says that the order cannot conflict with state law prohibiting restraints on, uh, restraints on trade, that's another pro-employer provision, and, and they're clearly making clear that, that they do not want to interfere with non-competes. Um, one last note on remedies and injunctive relief is that the statute also states that if exceptional circumstances render an injunction inequitable, the court can order a reasonable royalty for future use of the trade secret for no longer than the period for such use that would have been prohibited by the injunction. So it's interesting that there in one sense seems to be a pre presumption in favor of injunctive relief, which is not surprising given that it's a trade secret claim, but also provides us as an option or a fallback to the courts. And just um, one word of caution and something to think about if you're trying to decide whether you want to bring your claim in federal court or state court is there is um, a provision that includes attorney fee shifting. So attorney's fees may be awarded if a claim of misappropriation is brought in bad faith or if it's willfully and maliciously prosecuted or if a motion to terminate an injunction is made in bad faith. So just something to keep in mind before proceeding forward on those things. Another very key provision of the Defend Trade Secrets Act is its civil seizure provision. So this is a key procedural benefit to the Defend Trade Secret Act that is not existing in the um, laws that currently exist of a lot of states. And it offers a mechanism for a court to order a civil seizure that's enforced by law enforcement as a way to protect trade secrets. Now, the, a key aspect of the civil seizure provision is it does have a heightened showing from the standpoint that you have to prove extraordinary circumstances in order for the court to order the civil seizure. And it must be clearly apparent to the court, that's the word used in the statute, from the specific facts presented, which are presented either much like in a TRO context, either in an affidavit or verified complaint, that Rule 65 or the normal injunctive relief standards of the federal rules would be inadequate. The party would evade, avoid, or otherwise not comply with the order. Immediate and irreparable injury. And then there's a balancing of harms that the court must undertake. And the harm to the applicant of denying the request for civil seizure must outweigh the harm to the legitimate interests of the seizure target and also must substantially outweigh any harm to any third party. There must be a likelihood of succeeding on the merits, um, and you need to show that the target would destroy, move, hide, or otherwise make such matter inaccessible to the court if you gave them notice. Uh, there, so what does that mean, and, and, and how can you prove that the party is going to evade or otherwise not comply with a court order in the injunctive relief context? Well, this again brings into play any evidence of suspicious conduct that you have that you can show the court, uh, either how the employee um, or other party acted upon departure, deleting of information, things of that nature. If there was any kind of pre-suit communications and there's an indication the person's ignoring pre-suit communications, 
or refusing to comply with demands. Um, that's another example of some factual situations that might give rise to that. Um, and then there may be instances, too, where maybe there, you're um, a company that has an Ameri- have its American operations, but some of this is happening overseas in a country that's not particularly friendly to either IP or trade secret theft, and that may be something you may be able to utilize as well in convincing the court that the civil seizure provision should be invoked. And then on the civil seizure, it does require a security uh, to be posted, much like a bond in the TRO context. In the TRO context, it's very fact-specific what the amount of the bond will be. Here, for the security requirement, it's going to similarly be fact-specific because it's security that's determined adequate by the court for the payment of damages that any person may be entitled to recover as a result of a wrongful or excessive seizure or wrongful or excessive attempted seizure. So that will be very uh, fact-specific. Um, after the civil seizure order um, occurs and is conducted, there's a hearing as soon as, pos- as possible, no later than seven days later, where the applicant must prove entitlement to the order. And the statute, importantly, also provides a co- cause of action for someone who is the subject of a wrongful or excessive seizure. So again, that's something to keep in mind, much like the attorney fee shifting um, provision. So those at a high level are the remedies um, for uh, violation of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And I want to go back to the concept of inevitable disclosure and probable disclosure. I've given my thoughts on how um, I think there will be some confusion around this issue in, in light of the threatened misappropriation language and at the same time the language Uh, taking care to protect employee mobility. And I'll ask Caroline and Tom if you have anything to add in terms of considerations on those issues, since injunctive relief obviously is a key remedy in the trade secret context. No, no, absolutely. And it's it's an interesting development, especially from the perspective of uh, Tom and I practicing here in Massachusetts, because Massachusetts is one of the two states that has not adopted the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and we have also not embraced the inevitable dis- disclosure doctrine. And so when it comes to threat and misappropriation, it's, it's really tough for a trade secret owner to get that injunctive relief currently um, under state law, uh, especially, uh, at least if you don't have a non-compete in place, which actually Massachusetts is pretty friendly toward um, enforcing non-competes. And so, and so the Defend Trade Secrets Act really is um, a bit of a game changer, I think, for uh, trade secret owners who might look now toward federal court um, if they want to, uh, if they know that or suspect that their trade secret's gone out the door and they, and they want to get that um, injunctive relief before uh, it, it even gets implemented in a competitor's product or something like that. Um, I, think, I think just looking briefly um, before this webinar at, at California, it seems that the Defend Trade Secrets Act is, is pretty uh, closer in line with California, which has the same questions um, because they do reject the, uh, the concept of non-competes, um, but also reject the concept of inevitable disclosure, though they have said that when they, because they have uh, adopted some form of the UTSA, uh, when they look towards threatened misappropriation, they're looking at the same type of information and evidence that would go toward proving um, inevitable disclosure. So it, it might be a matter of semantics, and it, it throws up the same questions that the new federal law now um, probably creates. So uh, we'll be really interested in seeing how the case law develops on this front. Okay, great. So with that said, let's turn to the whistleblower immunity provisions. Again, another key um, provision for uh, the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And importantly, what those provisions do is provide civil and criminal immunity to an employee um, for the confidential disclosure of a trade secret to either the government or in a court filing, as long as the court filing or other proceeding um, filing is made under seal. Uh, The first prong when it protects disclosure of a trade secret to the government, it does so as long as that disclosure is solely for purpose of reporting an investigation um, or uh, reporting or investigation suspected violation of law. So that's the immunity provided. 
It also addresses the use of trade secret information in an anti-retaliation lawsuit. So in other words, retaliation by an employer for reporting a suspected violation of law, if a lawsuit results in that context, there's protection for the employee to disclose the trade secret in court as long as it's filed under seal and is not otherwise disclosed except pursuant to court order. So those are some significant policy provisions in the Defend Trade Secret Act. In addition to those policy provisions, um, and this is important and certainly has been already the subject of much discussion for employers, the employer shall provide notice of the immunity that we just discussed in any contract or agreement with an employee that governs the use of a trade secret or confidential information, or alternatively, uh, the employer can cross-reference a policy document in the contractor agreement um, as long as the policy document sets forth the employer's reporting policy for a suspected violation of law. Um, another thing that's very important to note that I'm not sure everyone has picked up on is that employee does extend to contractors and consultants who work for the employer. So this requires a look at not just employee, employee policies, but the agreements that you currently have with your employees, contractors, and consultants. So pretty broad language there. Um, so what are, you know, the, the statute uses the word shall, employer shall provide notice of the immunity. What are the repercussions for not doing so? Well, the repercussions that are specifically stated in the statute um, are that the employer may not be awarded exemplary damages or attorney's fees in an action against the employee um, under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So um, that is the specific uh, repercussion. Of course, it remains to be seen, especially given that the statute states that the employer shall provide notice, how else employees may um, argue that there should be other repercussions for not providing the required notice um, regarding immunity in future trade secret actions. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and I think it goes without saying the most prudent uh, way to proceed is to look at your agreements and put either the language in the agreements or in the policy manual. And whether you do that is and whether you do that and how you go about doing that is certainly um, a business decision that requires taking into account the set of circumstances that are unique to your business. Um, you might ask yourself, how much of a roadmap do I want to provide my employees? Um, how much do I want to call this out to them? Maybe, maybe you don't want to call it out as much and you want it in your policy manuals. And, and because your employee policies likely have a lot of discussion on confidential information and anti-retaliation laws in other contexts and whistleblowing rights in other contexts, it may make more sense for you to put those provisions there and just circle back to them. And regardless of how you do it, you certainly want to think about the language you provide and while you want to cover the notice and provide the notice exactly as the statute requests, you might be able to soften that language so it doesn't come across as you're essentially trying to encourage employees to, to sue. So there are ways that you can go about shaping this in the way that makes the most sense for your business. And the other thing you want to think about is really look carefully at, at your wording to make sure you're not somehow giving employees a false sense that they can start disclosing trade secrets. You want to be very precise in how you word it. Um, and it, it bears worth emphasizing that aside from putting the language in your agreements and policy manuals, it probably makes sense as part of your ongoing education and training to similarly continue to reiterate to your employees the importance of the confidentiality of your information so that you don't have any unintended co consequences from putting this notice provision in your agreements or policy manuals. So Natalie, I have a question. We have this um, shiny new toy now in the Defend Trade Secrets Act. How, how should companies think about um, choosing whether to proceed in, in state or federal court? That's a really good question, and I think it depends on 
your situation and um, the facts of the situation you're presented with. And what I would look at are the pros and cons of each, obviously. So a big pro for the Defend Trade Secrets Act is the civil seizure provision. How important is that to you? Do you think you can meet the extraordinary circumstances, the sort of stringent standard for obtaining the civil seizure provision? Obviously, that is something that's not available in other contexts, and that might be important enough to you to get you into federal court. There's also just generally the, loc the issue of where you're located, where you're going to be bringing your lawsuit, and um, that state, how that state feels about trade secrets. So some, some states might be better off in federal court if you're a trade secret plaintiff. Some might be state court. Um, I certainly know that for, as one example, in Texas, we're more than happy to go to state court um, over federal court um, as compared to other states where I know it's not, that's simply not the case. And as one example, what weighs into that is the recognition of the probable disclosure slash inevitable disclosure doctrine that we've been talking about. So I, that's where the facts um, that you're presented with really comes into play. Are you having to rely on something like inevitable or probable disclosure? If you are, um, you know, it remains to be seen what that landscape's going to be under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So you may not have as much predictability in federal court in that type of situation right now, or you certainly don't have as much predictability. Whereas in the state you're located in, that's something that maybe the door's been open on for a long time and you feel like you can put together a solid case but don't want to risk not knowing how it's going to go under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So I would look at the facts of your case on that and what kind of misappropriation you're going to have to prove. Um, I would think about the fee shifting pr provision as well. Um, I always look at this in all statutes when I bring a trade secret claim, but you know certain states may not have that, whereas the Defend Trade Secret Act does. I know in Texas we have one as well, but I would just look at that and consider it. Hopefully you have a strong case if you're bringing it, but if you have a case where um, you're not sure how strong it's going to be or how well it's going to pan out for you, the attorney fee shifting provision may be an important consideration for you. Do you have anything to add to that, Carolina? Tom? No, I think I think you did a great job covering it. Um, the only thing that I, I would probably like add as a as a consideration is um, the availability of attaching state law claims um, to your federal lawsuit and, and get supplemental jurisdiction over those claims as well. So it's not like you're giving up um, state law remedies um, altogether if you choose to proceed in federal court. There's always that option of tacking on those state law claims as well. I agree. I agree. That's really um, important. And I also wonder if anybody will try to utilize federal court for the civil seizure remedy, but then uh, bring separate claims in state court uh, for the life of the litigation. I'll be curious to see if anybody tries to get creative and do something like that too. But it definitely is important to consider the fact that you can really bring your claim under the statute of the state um, at, at play as well as the Defend Trade Secret Act, even if you do bring in federal court. Okay, with that said, wrapping up the Defend Trade Secret Act discussion, um, we just wanted to note that the Defend Trade Secret Act also requires a biannual report on foreign theft. The report is to be submitted by the Attorney General to committees on the Judiciary House of Representatives and Senate and to cover the scope and breadth of theft of trade secrets from U.S. companies and the extent that the theft is being sponsored by foreign governments and agents, as well as a discussion of the availability of me mechanisms for U.S. companies to prevent theft abroad and identification of any country whose laws on trade secret theft are a significant problem for U.S. countries. So, or companies, I apologize. So um, we note this. This doesn't really give us any a good substance in terms of how we can enforce our trade secrets in um, situations of foreign theft under the Defend Trade Secret Act, but it is worth noting that certainly Congress has this problem on its radar, and this is one of the many things that are going on right now where they're trying to figure out how to put things into play to address the very um, important and prevalent problem of trade secret theft overseas. All right, with that said, that concludes the Defend Trade Secret Act portion of the webinar, and I'm going to turn it over to Caroline to touch on a couple of issues to think about in the arbitration context when it comes to enforcing your trade secrets. And so, yes, I will be um, just really quickly blitzing through um, just some uh, arbitration considerations um, in the trade secret theft context. And then after arbitration, I'm going to go back and kind of follow up on, on Natalie's 
um, handoff on the on the forum theft of trade secrets issue and, and kind of take a look at what's been happening in the international arena. Um, what have the efforts been for the U.S. and, and other countries to kind of cooperate uh, and enforce trade secrets theft um, prosecutions or, or just IP rights protections generally. So turning to arbitration first, and I'll be really quick on this because I, I want to give Tom enough time to talk about the criminal issues uh, on trade secret theft, which are really, really interesting. Um, arbitration, for everybody who's logged into this webinar, they're probably very familiar with the concept. It's an alternative forum to litigating a dispute in court. Um, and reflexively, it's, it's often given a pro-business label. I just wanted to examine that a little more in the trade secret theft context. Uh, because some of the advantages that come with arbitration may not play in your favor if you're a trade secret owner and you're trying to um, prosecute your case. Uh, one of the biggest pros for arbitration is confidentiality. That's the default. Um, uh, in court, um, where the default is, is that everything is public, you have to take that extra step to ask the judge to seal the courtroom during trial or to file papers, uh, motions, pleadings under a seal if they describe a trade secret. Um, for someone who's trying to protect the secrecy of their trade secret, um, having to get the extra step and, and having the risk of inadvertently exposing and, and further disclosing your trade secret to, to others in the public, um, that, that's definitely a consideration that leans in favor of choosing arbitration. But um, some other assumptions about arbitration, such as their lower cost and, and the, uh, the more limited discovery that feeds into that lower cost, uh, that might not play in your favor because uh, trade secret claims tend to be technically complex, um, factually complex. You have to prove up the, the misappropriation uh, facts and, and that would require discovery. And, and so if, if you ha you're living in a limited discovery kind of a world, you may not be able to actually prosecute your case as effectively as, as you would like. Um, and also another big drawback with arbitration is, is unlike a court where you can run in and get a same day TRO or get a hearing um, within 24 to 48 hours on an emergency basis, you don't get that kind of exigent relief in the arbitration context. Uh, and in fact, in most arbitration processes, you have a lot of opportunities for delay and gamesmanship kind of built in. Um, for example, uh, parties tend to uh, draft in their arbitration clauses that they will uh, agree on an arbitration panel. You know, one side selects one, one side selects the other, and then there's a lot of back and forth and fighting, and then there are days built in if, if parties can't come to agreement on issues like that. Um, in arbitration clauses, it's also pretty typical that there's a, a pre-initiation negotiation period where the parties try to come together and resolve the dispute um, between themselves before the arbitration even starts. And so that's another opportunity where delay just gets built in, built in and you just can't run and um, get an, an injunction to stop the further dissemination or disclosure of your trade secret. And finally, if uh, the other side, you get your award and, and you win, but the other side doesn't comply with the arbitration award, you're still running into court to, to enforce it. And so uh, companies should really think about like, and make a conscious decision, like, do I want to arbitrate trade secret theft disputes in particular? And um, it, it's, it's fine if you do, and if, if you do, go in there consciously and kind of draft your arbitration clauses very carefully to kind of minimize the opportunities where the other side can play games and uh, draw things out. Um, but, and also you can maybe automate some of the processes such as um, selecting your arbitration panel in advance. Uh, but if you don't, then it would really, if you really don't think that arbitration for trade secret theft is a good idea, then carve it out. Uh, you can always introduce language into your arbitration clauses to, to carve out trade secret um, misappropriation allegations or disputes, and that way you can rest easy knowing that if a situation does come up, that um, the courts are always available to you. And, and this is a real um, issue. Uh, in the past year, we've had these two cases. They both came out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, weirdly, um, but where courts have enforced uh, arbitration clauses against trade secret owners who are trying to uh, uh, enforce their uh, trade secret rights against uh, thieves and former employees. 
Um, and and that's, that's a real problem, especially if you as the trade secret owner are, are typically drafting the arbitration clause in the, con in the contracts themselves. And so you kind of lose a bit of the defense that the arbitration clause is invalid or unenforceable. Um, you'll have to argue a scope, which is actually much harder because courts tend to favor enforcing arbitration clauses if, if the, the scope of the claim fits. And so here I've just kind of highlighted two um, arbitration clauses. Um, that ensnare the trade secret owner and, and, and where the courts enforce them against them and they were forced to arbitrate their trade secret theft claims. Um, the second one on the slide in particular is, is a consulting agreement uh, where the arbitration clause govern any disputes arising from the performance of the consulting agreement. And here the consultant was accused of having access to the trade secret owner's um, confidential information and then made off with it and, and started, started competing with them. Um, and, and so, you know, don't only look at your employee agreements, look at all your service contracts as well. Um, any opportunity where your confidential information can be disclosed or shared with um, other parties such as uh, consultants, such as joint venturers or, or any parties that you're collaborating with, maybe even licensing agreements, um, make sure to take a look at those and, and check the arbitration clauses and uh, don't agree to something that um, you don't intend to because it would... Uh, really be unfortunate to be dragged into arbitration uh, by a clause that was meant to protect you in the first place. So having dealt in my, given my five-minute spiel on arbitration, I'm going to move on to uh, international developments, um, kind of building off of what Natalie was talking about with the biannual, biannual report. Um, and here I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that has gotten a lot of press lately, especially in this crazy election season that we're going through. And then I'm going to just talk quickly about um, China, which really could be a webinar all in and of itself. It's such a huge topic. Um, but I just wanted to touch quickly on kind of the diplomacy efforts that the United States has been going through uh, with China and, and trying to uh, address what many perceive to be China's disproportionate role in uh, using cyber espionage in particular uh, to for commercial advantage. And um, I'll also touch a little bit on some of the structure and tips in, in trying to enforce your trade secrets if you do business in China. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, if you haven't been following this story, it is, um, here's a little map and you can see all the countries that are involved. Um, there are 12 signatories, but there are more at the negotiating table because there's a lot of interest in this really massive free trade agreement, which um, the objectives are to lower tariffs and promote economic growth. Um, and it, there also is a big push to kind of get uniform standards for intellectual property protection. And of, of course, like trade secrets falls under that umbrella as well. Um, China is conspicuously absent as, uh, as a signatory. Um, this, this agreement was signed on February 4th of 2016. And uh, while the 12 countries have signed on and, the, and there are more that are eager to sign on, uh, it doesn't take effect until a certain number of countries ratify uh, the, the agreement or if all countries ratify within, uh, the, the, within two years of signing, which it's probably the chances of that are close to none. Uh, so I've kind of put up a chart here kind of um, show, showing you the ratification progress of each of the countries that you see only Malaysia has ratified right now and they actually were so eager to ratify they did it before uh, the TPP was signed. Um, in the United States and of course the United States by virtue of its GDP is one of the most important signatories and the TPP will not be ratified uh, overall if the U.S. doesn't do it. Um, it it's a huge election issue right now and, and as every day that goes by I think the chances of the TPP being ratified are, are diminishing. So this may all be a moot point um, in the end, but uh, it, it definitely is something that uh, people are keeping an eye on, not just in the trade secret realm, but, but, but overall. Um, in copy, copyright patents, they, they, they have massive effects there too. Um, so just taking a look specifically at um, TPP's effect on trade secrets, right now across the signatories, um, there, there are varying uh, statutes and um, standards for uh, on, on ways how companies can enforce their trade secrets. Uh, in the United States, um, if you look at the requirements that the TPP imposes on its member states, 
Um, Article 18.78 has requires the member states to have certain civil and criminal pr protections of trade secrets, and the United States actually now, especially with the Defend Trade Secrets Act that Natalie talked about, um, we are in full compliance with both. Um, but there are certainly many countries, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada come to mind, that don't have criminal uh, statutes in place that protect trade secret theft, uh, whereas the U United States does with the Economic Espionage Act that Tom's going to talk about shortly. Um, so if the TPP is ratified, it will bring about a uniformity in trade secret protections, and that obviously is great news for countries, uh, for, for companies rather, that do business internationally to just have this nice uniform standard and, and peace of mind as they go and do business in all these various countries that their trade secrets will be protected at the same level. And so moving on from the TPP, I'm going to turn to China now, um, which the, the United States has really done a, a carrot and stick approach uh, with regard to trade secrets and China um, over almost 30% of the uh, criminal economic espionage cases that the DOJ has brought since the statute was enacted in 96 have been targeted uh, toward cases where trade secrets were allegedly routed back to China. And so it, it's, a, it's definitely, a, it, China's definitely a disproportionate player. And here's a timeline on some kind of the, the push and pull that's gone between the two countries uh, on trying to get onto the same page. Um, on, on trade secrets and cyber espionage in particular. And uh, it started really in 2014 with an, an executive order by President Obama announcing that um, the United States would consider sanctions against uh, countries that uh, conduct cyber espionage for um, trade secret theft. Uh, then that was followed promptly by the first ever indictment against state actors uh, for computer hacking and economic espionage, and it was against uh, uh, some military hackers that were working on behalf of the People's Liberation Army in China who were charged um, under the EEA. And this was pure posturing, right? There's just no chance that the DOJ can extradite these these five military personnel from China to, to the United States, but it was meant to send a message. And um, that's since followed in the first half of 2015 with some reports leaking that the U.S. is considering sanctions against China for trade secret theft, and, um, but that culminated in China starting to respond um, shortly before President Xi Jinping's state visit to the United States. There were um, arrests of hackers into the, uh, that were suspected to have conducted the OPM hack, um, which was a massive data breach of the Office of Personnel Management in the United States. And then shortly thereafter, uh, after a successful state visit, the United States and China announced a joint agreement that neither country would uh, conduct or knowingly support cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property. And this is like kind of the first time China's really drawn a line between cyber espionage for economic purposes as opposed to for intelligent purposes, which presumably um, it is still uh, going on. But um, as commentators have said, uh, words are one thing, whether the actions follow are another. Um, there have been conflicting reports. Uh, some researchers, such as CrowdStrike, have reported that hacks originating, re originating from China still continued, um, despite the handshake. Uh, but other researchers have noticed that, at least in terms of the state-sponsored hackers, uh, those attacks seem to have ceased. So it does seem like the agreement has had some effect. I think, at best, we can give it an incomplete grade, and we'll continue to uh, monitor uh, whether China will get onto the same page. Of course, um, if China signs onto the TPP, that is a massive game changer, and um, we will definitely see the landscape um, um, change in, in that regard if China does sign on. So, Caroline, what are some of the best practices that companies should employ to best protect their trade secrets when doing business in China? I am very glad you asked. So, uh, one of the best things you can do is first kind of understand how um, trade secret enforcement is conducted in China. Uh, China has really been recognizing that it wants to be an innovation economy, that that's its future. Um, you could see it in the, the latest five-year plan where the word innovation has been used, I think, over 70 times um, in market contrast to, to prior five-year plans. Um, they, they've really taken steps to kind of try and reform and promote trade secret protection 
in, uh, in China. And so they, they've launched three dedicated IP courts uh, that started at the end of 2014. Um, and, and so these three courts are in Beijing, uh, Guangzhou, and Shanghai. And they are dedicated to uh, adjudicating um, all intellectual property issues, including patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, especially of the technical variety. Um, so trade secret owners, if they suspect that they have been the victim of trade secret theft, they have three enforcement options. They have administrative claims. They can bring civil suit, or, or they can refer the case to local prosecutors. And because of the difficulties with administrative claims and, and, and local prosecutors as well, where you really need to have good relationships with the people on the ground in order to get those two um, parties to really take your case and, and, and carry the ball over the goal line on your behalf, civil suits still tend to be um, the most viable option for most companies. Um, but there are challenges uh, because there's no discovery process uh, in Chinese litigation, and so the burden of collecting um, the evidence that you need to prove up uh, that you have a trade secret, that the trade secret was actually misappropriated, uh, that all needs to be done on your own dime by yourself. And of course, you can't collect evidence um, in violation of the law, so uh, you, you you know, use some, some conventional or, or intuitive mechanisms by which you collect evidence, like hiring a PI, for example, that might not be an option in China if you can't guarantee that everything will be admissible because it was collected lawfully. Um, the, the biggest tip that I would give if you are thinking about um, uh, doing business in China and have the prospects of disclosing your trade secrets there is to document, document, document. Um, the Chinese courts tend to really weigh uh, documentary evidence heavily over witness testimony. And so not only do you want to have everything documented in your um, confidentiality agreements that you sign with joint ventures or with consultants or third parties where trade secrets may um, be disclosed to those parties, you'll want to really specifically um, describe your trade secret in there. Um, in the United States with, with NDAs, you often have pretty blanket confidential information clauses such as, you know, confidential information means uh, everything that's not public and it includes know-how and, and uh, technical uh, uh, te techniques and um, chemistry and everything. Like, it's a really broad, you know, every scientific processes, really broad blanket umbrella statements. In, in China, a court won't give that much weight um, if you don't specifically carve out, this is my trade secret, these are the parameters, these are the four corners. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind um, and probably my biggest uh, tip if, if you are thinking about uh, enforcing your trade secrets in China. And, and aside um, from bringing uh, litigation in China, um, what other options are out there if a company believes their trade secrets have been misappropriated by for a foreign company? Well, one of the biggest um, opportunities that you have that doesn't get as much play, um, but really should be an active uh, consideration for companies is the ITC. Um, if you are a U.S. company and you suspect that your trade secret has been stolen uh, a a and incorporated into products that are then going to be imported into the United States, uh, the ITC is a fantastic forum um, that you can bring uh, a complaint in and, and start an investigation. Uh, and the remedy that you might get is that the ITC might issue an order that stops the importation of products that incorporate your stolen trade secret from importation into the United, into the United States. So, that, so that's, a, that's a really effective remedy um, that, and something that companies should consider if they, if they fall victim. Um, so here I need to read out the New Jersey, New York CLE code, it is 362 for those of you hoping to get CLE in those two states. And um, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Tom who will talk a bit more about kind of the DOJ's uh, efforts in uh, enforcing trade secret theft on the criminal side. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Frangelo, a principal in the Boston office of Fish and Richardson. And I previously served for almost 10 years as an assistant United States attorney for the District of Massachusetts in Boston. And most of the work that I do is in the white collar area, including cases involving criminal theft of trade secrets. So in the last portion of the program here, we're going to talk about criminal law issues pertaining to trade secrets theft. And we'll cover three topics. Uh, first, I'll give a brief overview of the Economic Espionage Act and then talk about two common scenarios that companies face 
uh, in trade secrets case. Uh, the first scenario is when the company itself is a victim of the theft and it's considering referring the matter to law enforcement. And the second scenario is when the company discovers that it has a rogue employee that has either stolen or misappropriated the trade secret of a competitor and is using that trade secret in the workplace. So moving over to the EEA, um, this October will mark the 20th anniversary of the enactment of the EEA, and the EEA makes the theft or misappropriation of trade secrets a federal crime, and it's codified at uh, 18 United States Code sections 1831 through 37. It's a relatively short statute, uh, and it was enacted by Congress 20 years ago uh, because basically U.S. Uh, businesses, academic institutions, defense contractors, government agencies were being increasingly victimized by both commercial trade secret theft as well as Economic Espionage Act. Uh, and many of the perpetrators were foreign adversaries and competitors that were trying to acquire, steal, transfer a broad range of trade secrets in which uh, the United States maintained a definitive innovation advantage. Uh, oftentimes, the perpetrators had state sponsorship and backing, but there were also an alarming number of cases involving domestic commercial trade secrets theft. So when Congress drafted the EEA, it addressed both forms of trade secrets theft. And so there are two types of violations under the statute. Commercial trade secret theft occurs when somebody knowingly steals and misappropriates a trade secret uh, to the economic benefit of anybody but the owner, and that is found in Section 1832 of the statute. Economic espionage, on the other hand, occurs when the trade secret is stolen for the benefit of a foreign government, instrumentality, or agent, and that's prosecuted under Section 1831. Now, there's been a number of high-profile EEA prosecutions of both commercial trade secret theft and economic espionage, and I'll briefly give you an example of each. Uh, perhaps one of the most well-known uh, commercial trade secret uh, cases is United States versus Cologne Industries, and, and this is uh, DuPont's long-standing uh, battle with a company from South Korea. The indictment uh, occurred in 2012, and Cologne and five executives were indicted under the EEA. Uh, basically, the indictment alleged that uh, Cologne and the other defendants had approached current and former employees of DuPont and Tejan uh, and paid them to reveal trade secrets pertaining to uh, DuPont's Kevlar technology, which is used, as you probably have heard before, in body armor as well as optic cables and other products. Uh, this case was brought to a conclusion in 2015 when Cologne, uh, through successor entities, uh, pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to convert trade secrets. They paid a huge fine, $85 million, but even a larger amount in restitution, uh, $275 million. Now, along with the criminal case, DuPont uh, filed uh, parallel civil litigation, actually before the criminal case was, was uh, indicted. So in 2009, DuPont sued uh, Cologne in the Eastern District of Virginia under the Virginia Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and this case went to trial, and it was a huge verdict, a $920 million verdict, uh, and a worldwide 20-year injunction was imposed barring Cologne from producing and manufacturing uh, the Kevlar type fiber for uh, this lengthy period of time. Well, that case got reversed by the Fourth Circuit, and just this past year, in 2015, in conjunction with the resolution of the criminal case, the case was uh, settled, and that's the $275 million restitution. So that's an example of commercial trade secret. On the other hand, uh, another noted uh, case involving economic espionage, and this is the type of espionage we would consider uh, spying. And this, this case is United States versus Dong Fun Chung, indicted in the Central District of California in 2008. And Mr. Chung was a Boeing engineer who had worked for Boeing for years, 
and he was accused of stealing Boeing's trade secrets related to the space shuttle program and the Delta IV rocket. And the FBI uh, raided uh, Mr. Chung's house and found concealed over 300,000 sensitive documents in crawl spaces. And in addition to the space shuttle and the Delta IV rocket, uh, there was confidential information pertaining to the F-15 fighter and the B-52 uh, bomber. And the uh, evidence that was uh, assimilated showed that uh, Mr. Chung had allegedly been uh, spending the past 30 years providing U.S. aerospace technology to China. Uh, he was a gentleman in his mid-70s when sentenced to over 15 years in prison, and th that was effectively deemed to be a life sentence for him, uh, a very harsh penalty uh, for committing economic espionage. Um, there, you know, aside from Boeing and DuPont, uh, there have been many large companies and household names that have been Fortune 500 companies victimized by criminal trade secret theft. Uh, and have been victims in EEA cases, and they range from virtually all sectors of our economy, pharmaceutical, medical device, financial services, uh, the motor vehicle industry, high technology, chemical industry, etc. cetera. Um, and as you would uh, probably expect, there's an endless type of uh, trade secrets that have, have been involved in criminal prosecutions, and you can see here, uh, a sampling of trade secrets which range from the you know, Coca-Cola's formula to computer source code to financial business plans. Uh, the penalties for violating the EPA are uh, quite harsh, as you just heard me say with respect to Mr. Chung, who got 15 years for economic espionage. Uh, it's uh, a maximum prison sentence of up to 10 years for commercial trade secret theft. Uh, there also are hefty fines. Uh, when an EEA case is indicted, it almost never is a freestanding indictment of just EEA uh, charges. Uh, the federal government will frequently bring Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, uh, charges in the indictment because many trade secrets are stolen through computer hacking uh, and misuse of, uh, of, of computers. So you'll see Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, you'll see mail fraud, wire fraud, interstate transportation of stolen property, and of course there also are many state statutes, aside from the EEA, uh, that criminalize the theft of trade secrets, and uh, while well, that wouldn't be brought in federal court, uh, those types of remedies are available to victims as well. Uh, I'd like to now turn and uh, end the overview section and turn to the two scenarios that I mentioned earlier. And the first one is uh, when a company is a victim of uh, trade secret theft and is considering the possibility of referring uh, the case to law enforcement authorities. And this is a big question for most companies because they're not used to dealing with federal law enforcement. And uh, frankly, it, it is a uh, difficult question for many companies because there are pros and cons, which I'll address shortly. Uh, but one thing that you should know is that even if a company decides to go forward and to meet with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, that does not automatically mean that the case is going to be accepted for prosecution. Uh, the EEA was never meant to criminalize every trade secret uh, theft, uh, particularly because there have been existing civil, civil remedies for victims. But you'll, you'll find in the United States Attorney's Manual uh, the Department of Justice prosecution policy uh, and five discretionary factors that DOJ considers when deciding whether or not to accept uh, a matter for criminal prosecution under sections 1831 or 32. I won't read through them, but you can see them here on this slide. No one factor uh, is definitive, but I will say that if um, the matter does involve a foreign government, it gets uh, uh, quite a bit more attention. There have not been as many of those cases that have been brought, but they uh, certainly uh, rise to the top in terms of uh, Department of Justice interest. Um, so what are the factors that a victim should weigh in making the decision whether or not to refer a case to law enforcement? And you know, one of the first things that uh, a company has to do is consider the strength of, of its case. Uh, and the reason for that 
is that unlike in the civil realm, when the government prosecutes a case under the EEA, it has to prove each and every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. There is a high standard of proof. And so it only stands to reason that if a company is going to go forward and meet with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, it better have all of its ducks in a row, and it really needs to put forth a compelling case to show that this isn't a garden variety uh, civil trade secrets case and that the evidence is, uh, will meet the standard of proof. And so what really needs to happen before um, a, a company can go forward to uh, meet with federal prosecutors is it needs to conduct a thorough internal investigation. And because many trade secrets uh, involve uh, uh, computers and trade secret theft is done often by hacking, uh, it's wise to engage an independent uh, outside forensic expert as well as outside counsel to conduct that investigation uh, to determine uh, what exactly happened, who knew about it, and to match up the elements of the crime with the proof uh, so that when you go forward to report, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office is going to be trying to check off the box for each of the elements of the crime, and it's certainly going to want to know what the evidence is uh, as to each element. So I, I want to now just uh, briefly address the pros and cons about going forward and uh, handing your case off or, or asking that it be prosecuted by federal authorities. Uh, first, let's take a, a look at what some of the advantages are. If you are a small company, maybe a startup company, and, and you don't have a big war chest, cost can be an issue. Uh, as you probably know, that when the federal government decides to go forward, and proceed with a prosecution, it bears the bill. It assigns uh, assistant United States attorneys and the FBI is the lead investigative agency. And these things don't cost the company any money. Uh, there are costs associated, of course, with cooperating uh, with the uh, federal authorities and showing up and uh, being prepared and interviewed, as well as uh, going to the grand jury, testifying at trial. But in the big scheme of things, um, this is one way to keep the cost down. Uh, also, uh, because of the Speedy Trial Act, criminal cases are generally resolved more quickly than uh, civil cases, so cost can be one factor. Uh, another factor, and, and this depends on whether you think you really have a strong case or not, uh, could be the federal government's superior investigatory techniques and tactics. Uh, the federal government can do things that an ordinary civil litigant can't do. It can use search warrants, wiretaps, consensual recordings, grand jury subpoenas. It can immunize witnesses. It can conduct uh, covert surveillance techniques, and it can use informants. And, and the, the FBI was uh, conducting surveillance of Mr. Chung for quite a period of time before they executed the search warrant. Um, in that case involving Boeing's trade secrets. So that's a consideration in going to the federal government. Um, another important one is what is the impact of, uh, of a criminal proceeding on what could be parallel civil litigation? Because most uh, victims of trade secret theft uh, may well want to proceed in civil uh, court and file a lawsuit either under the new statute or uh, also bring state claims. And if the victim has already filed a lawsuit, uh, it's possible that the perpetrator or the defendant in the defendant's employees may invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege in a civil case and refuse to testify. And, and that can be a two-edged sword. Uh, in civil litigation, the assertion of the Fifth Amendment uh, can result in an adverse inference against uh, uh, a defendant. Uh, but it also blocks uh, discovery that might otherwise be compelled. So if you wanted to depose somebody and they took the fifth, you're not going to get any information out of it. Uh, also, uh, it may uh, impact how a perpetrator or a defendant answers a complaint, responds to discovery. Uh, they may decline to do so. Uh, and again, that may be useful in the, in the civil case. Uh, because uh, it can result in adverse inferences or admissions in favor of a victim. Um, if uh, a company decides to wait, uh, obviously within the statute of limitations, and see what the outcome of a criminal case, 
if a company or, or an individual is convicted, uh, there can be collateral estoppel. The, uh, the conviction itself can establish uh, the necessary liability in a follow-on civil litigation case and make the job much easier for uh, a company that wants to pursue civil remedies on top of uh, what happened in the criminal proceeding. One possible drawback of proceeding down the road of, uh, of parallel civil and criminal matters is the uh, possibility that a defendant or even the government could seek to stay the civil case uh, if they believe uh, from, from the government standpoint that it would jeopardize a uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, it's more unlikely in an EEA case because there's cooperation going on with the victim. Um, but the defendant may claim that uh, his or her constitutional rights are being uh, affected by the uh, prosecution of a, of a civil proceeding at the same time of the criminal case. And their courts have intervened and stayed uh, parallel civil cases to let a cl criminal case play out first. Uh, deterrent effect. Uh, DuPont has had a number of uh, criminal trade secret cases, and DuPont has reported them to the United States Attorney's Office, and there have been a number of prosecutions. Uh, the reporting of a civil uh, of a criminal prosecution it can send a loud and clear message to current and former employees and competitors that, that uh, yeah, if you steal from this company, there's going to be severe consequences for uh, that type of conduct. Disadvantages. Uh, cost can be a, a disadvantage, uh, again, all depending on budget. If you're operating in two spheres at the same time, both criminally and civilly, and um, oftentimes uh, you'll see commentators say that the lack of control is perhaps the most important factor that is a disadvantage, that once the criminal process is initiated, the victim no longer controls the situation. It's federal prosecutors and agents that work for the United States and not for the company. And their job, first and foremost, is to enforce the criminal laws. And they, they make the, uh, the calls on critical aspects of the case, including the investigation, how the grand jury is going to run, the drafting of the allegations in the indictment, case strategy, how the case is going to be presented in court. Um, frankly, uh, it's been my experience that that's an overstated disadvantage uh, that in trade secret cases and in other cases where there's cooperation as a victim, uh, the victim, I think, does have uh, more input than um, commentators will actually uh, say when they are identifying this as a disadvantage. Uh, the one thing that can happen is that these simultaneous proceedings can impact uh, the timing of a resolution. Uh, we saw that in the DuPont Cologne case. Uh, there were many years of litigation, of civil and criminal litigation. Nobody caved in, but finally they were wrapped up in 2015 simultaneously. So it could, uh, the presence of a criminal prosecution could end up delaying uh, a uh, more prompt resolution. Um, how do you actually refer a case to law enforcement? I'll just speak briefly on that, but tell you that the Department of Justice has a published guide online that uh, it's called Reporting Intellectual Property Crime, a guide for victims of counterfeiting, copyright infringement, and theft of trade secrets. And this is, the guide also has a checklist with 43 questions that covers what you would consider to be the key subjects is the description of the trade secret, uh, physical measures to protect the trade secret, identification of confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements, computer stored trade secrets, document control, employee control, how the theft occurred, and whether or not there's parallel proceedings. Um, I would just say this, is that a, a victim that is planning on going forward in reporting would be well served by retaining uh, respected security personnel, forensic, independent outside forensic experts, and counsel uh, that have existing relationships with DOJ, the FBI, or the local U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, I'll just make a passing note on, on the, the next point here, is that like civil litigation, uh, the EEA provides for confidentiality and protective orders, even in the investigatory stage, uh, in the pretrial stage and at trial, 
And uh, there have been instances uh, in the Goldman Sachs uh, source code case where the courtroom was closed seven different times. Um, obviously, this has to be with the approval of the district court judge, but also with the approval of the deputy attorney general. Um, so there, there are confidentiality and protective orders that can be put in place to make sure that the victim's trade secrets aren't uh, just spilled out into the public, uh, which is a concern. Let me now turn to the last uh, scenario, and that's the discovery of the rogue employee that is using uh, the trade secret of a competitor in the workplace. And I'll just use a very simple hypothetical that uh, a company hires a scientist from a competitor. Unbeknownst to the company, the scientist uh, has stolen trade secrets from the former employee, uh, employer, uh, such as either technology or a chemical formula for a new drug. And well, at the new company, the scientist continues to conduct in, uh, experimentation in the lab using the stolen trade secrets. And as a result of work done by the scientist, the trade secret ends up on the company's uh, computers and in lab books. And the way the company will often find out about these things is from uh, an internal hotline, uh, a fellow employee observes uh, the incident, or a supervisor when reviewing work could find out. Uh, this poses a significant problem for an innocent company that had nothing to do with this, did not encourage this type of behavior. Uh, and that's because under the EEA, it is a crime to knowingly possess a trade secret of another without their authorization. And in the hypothetical scenario, the company knows that it's in possession of the trade secret of a competitor and didn't get authorization to possess it. Uh, this is a similar scenario in civil law where a company can be held vicariously liable for the wrongs of an employee that uh, are committed during the course of employment for the benefit of the company. But there is a key difference, and it really is a meaningful one, is that under the EEA, uh, the government has to prove two intent elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And one is that uh, there was an intent to misappropriate the trade secret, and the other is an intent to use the trade secret for economic benefit of someone other than the owner or knowledge or intent that the use of that trade secret is going to harm the owner. So really what the objective needs to be for the company is to establish a factual basis that it, it had no intent to misappropriate or use the competitor's trade secret and that it has taken all possible steps to remedy the situation. So what do you do with the stolen trade secrets? You can't destroy them because under the EEA, it's a crime to destroy the trade secret of another without authorization. And you also can't retain the trade secret, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because it's a, it's a crime to possess the trade secret. And that's true even if it's a photocopy. Uh, it's not an original. It could be photocopies. I'm sure that Mr. Chung had photocopies of the Boeing trade secrets. They weren't the original documents, the 300,000 documents uh, squirreled away under his house. So just because it's a photocopy doesn't mean you can uh, put it in the shredder and get rid of it. Um, remedial steps need to be taken, and they really need to be done uh, immediately because one of the object objectives here is to convince the Department of Justice, if they ever come knocking or if you decide to report this, that you're wearing the white hat. And again, what, what has to happen is a thorough, comprehensive internal investigation using outside counsel. You need an independent, reputable forensic expert uh, to analyze computers and emails to find out if the trade secret is on the system. Uh, the other employees need to be questioned as to whether they knew about this because that could implicate them if they knew that a co-employee was using a, a stolen trade secret of a competitor and they didn't do anything about it. Um, identification of how the trade secret was used in the workplace needs to happen. And, and then once all this is found out, uh, the company has to uh, contain the trade secret from spreading, particularly if it's on computers or, or in like a lab workplace. Uh, th there needs to be employee discipline, which will often be termination of the rogue employee. Uh, there 
should be remedial steps taken to enhance whatever internal controls are done. Uh, uh, and everything, everything needs to be documented because there's a prospect that this is, this is going to be reported uh, down the road to law enforcement. And there's the issue about disclosing to the victim. Uh, if a company has the property of a victim, that property needs to be returned. And in cases that I've had where this has occurred, the victim will uh, want to know the details. How did you find out about the fact that you had our trade secret? What have you done to make sure that nobody else gets it? And that's why it's important to do the interview reports and to, and to make sure you have an independent uh, outside counsel happening, that it's not all being done internally, that you have forensic experts that, if need be, uh, could meet with the victim. Some of this may sound counterintuitive because there may be uh, a knee-jerk reaction about uh, holding the cards close to the vest, uh, something like this, but at this stage where it's a rogue employee and there's no proof of company involvement, the idea is to isolate that rogue employee and show that there was no intent to violate the law and that every conceivable thing that could be done to prevent the company from using that trade secret or, or even um, inadvertently disclosing it to others within the workplace has been done. The, the issue about reporting this to law enforcement is very interesting, and in, in, uh, particularly in light of the fact that on September 9 of 2015, uh, the Department of Justice issued what's known as the Yates Memo after Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, uh, in which the DOJ announced a new guideline regarding individual accountability for wrongdoing. Um, uh, the DOJ now expects, and they actually have always expected this, but now they're emphasizing it even more, that companies will report wrongdoing of individuals to the Department of Justice, that they will do a prompt and thorough investigation, and that they won't hold back. If they've done interviews uh, and they've got forensic evidence, that they're going to share it with the government. And this uh, could obviate any criminal proceeding against the company for any liability for what the rogue employee did. Uh, but it also shows that the company had no intent the company took remedial measures. The company quarantined computers. The company notified the victim. The company fired the employee. Uh, the company enhanced compliance and training in, in any way that it could, or that the company had uh, strong compliance and training in place. All these things become important factors uh, relative to whether or not uh, there will be any type of criminal proceeding against the company. I, I know that we're, we've gone uh, over our time here, so I'll conclude it uh, with this by saying these are serious issues. They have to be addressed in, in a serious way, uh, and uh, they need to be addressed very promptly. So um, again, apologize for going over the time, the allotted hour today. There are two or three questions it looks like we're going to go ahead and answer here, but we want to let everyone know for those of you who need to um, hop off that haven't already done so. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. We're going to post an on-demand replay within 48 hours of today, and you'll receive a link via email. So if you want to go back to listen to anything, including the question and answer session, please feel free to do that. Um, so let's look at some of the questions we've received. Um, one of the questions is to further discuss the difference between a trade secret and confidential information. Um, and the way I like to think about those differences is essentially uh, I can have confidential information that's protected for one reason or the other but does not rise to the level of what a trade secret is. And the way the courts um, and the way the DTSA is going to look at what a trade secret is, is whether you as the owner of the information have taken reasonable measures to keep it secret. And you look at a number of factors for that. You know, uh, employee policy manuals uh, prohibit the disclosure of the, of the information and define it as confidential. You have employment agreements or other agreements that specifically prohibit the disclosure of the information, security measures you take to protect the information, whether you share it only with those on a need-to-know basis, and the list goes on. Um, that's one aspect to proving uh, information as trade secret. The other aspect is proving that the information derives independent economic value um, from not being generally known or readily ascertainable. 
through proper means. Um, so you have to prove it has value to the company, um, that it's not readily available or cannot be determined by something that's in the public domain. And assuming that you can prove the elements of a trade secret, then you have a trade secret. But sometimes there might be information that maybe for one reason or the other, it doesn't rise to the level of a trade secret, but it's confidential information either because it's treated that way by the company and or it's defined as confidential information in a contract with your employee or with a third party. And so you might be able to get protection of that confidential information under a simple breach of contract theory, for example, um, even if you may not be able to prove it rises to the level of being, quote, trade secret under the particular law you're trying to enforce it under. So in general, that's the difference between um, confidential information and trade secret information. The next question is regarding, quote, employees who are contractors or consultants. And this goes back to the language we discussed earlier of the whistleblower immunity and notice to be given about those immunity provisions. Um, if my company does an agreement, a consulting agreement or a subcontractor agreement with a company where the company's employees will be rendering various services to us, where they'll be exposed to our trade secrets. Can this statute be used by us to go after that individual? And the answer to that question is yes, assuming that you can prove misappropriation as that's defined in the statute. Um, the typical situation, this will come up in the case of a contractor or consultant, is you have your agreement with them. You specifically prohibit the disclosure of your confidential information and trade secrets. That creates a duty for them not to disclose or misuse that information. If they breach that duty to you by misusing your information, then you've proven essentially wrongful means uh, that rises to the level of misappropriation. So yes is the answer to that question. Yeah, we look like we have a question about civil seizure as to what civil seizure means and what does it entail under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, Natalie? Sure. So a civil seizure is when the court orders that certain information can be literally physically seized from the target of the seizure order. And what happens is the court orders the seizure, and then law enforcement is notified and becomes involved and will go execute the seizure at that person's place of business or wherever the order provides. So, for example, you might get an order that allows computers to be seized. And you work with law enforcement, you take that order and you show up um, it's ex parte, so they're not expecting it since it's, you know, without notice. And you show up and you're able to seize the property um, immediately. So, for example, in, in the trademark context and counterfeiting context, this happens in a not infrequent basis. And it's different than if you're just left with an injunction where you have an order prohibiting the disclosure of misuse of information. Here you can actually seize property if you're concerned that they're not going to follow that order on their own. We look like we have another question, um, which is along the first lines of the, uh, lines of the first question about trade secrets versus confidential information. Um, how does an employee's know-how fit into the definition uh, or, or, or the legal treatment under the law? Uh, so some of this is going to be defined um, and determined by your contract with your employee and what the contract uh, provides. But typically, um, unless it's carved out otherwise, that know-how if that employee is working in the course and scope of their duties um, as your employee is going to, and assuming you provide that it's confidential and it's to be treated confidentially, and you take precautions to protect it as confidential, and you can show that it's otherwise entitled to trade secret status, then that information is going to be your information that um, is protectable and that you can enforce if it's misused. But again, um, you also have to look at the specific contract or agreement you have with the particular employee. I believe I also saw a question earlier about standard language available to address the whistleblower notification clause of the DTSA. Um, so in, in my opinion, there should not be standard language to address in this situation, although a lot of the language will be similar, I'm sure, from employer to employer. But because of the situation I was discussing or the circumstances I was discussing earlier, we all have different um, 
uh, I think, business needs and circumstances that need to be taken into account. And, um, you know, the easiest way to go about doing it, if you're looking for how to go about doing it, is to simply track the language of the statute. You're, you're going to have a hard – it's going to be hard for an employee to argue you didn't meet the notice provision if you basically – notify the employer by tracking the very language of the statute. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, however, again, I think you need to look at how strong you want that language to be, how much you want to raise the employee's radar, and think about softening it. You might start off with language along the lines of, uh, of explaining that certain trade secrets may be subject to the Defend Trade Secret Act, and, and the employee may have certain rights. Um, in other words, it's something that may exist as opposed to, you know, you can go sue for retaliation of X, Y, and Z. So I think it requires some finessing, and it also requires looking at the policies you have and thinking about um, sort of a, ba a delicate balance here of notifying uh, but not laying out too much of a roadmap for your employees. I think we have gotten all the questions. I think that's right. All right. Great. So uh, everyone, thank you again for your time today. Please feel free to uh, email us with any questions, either regarding your CLE credit, which you can email FISH's MCLE, MCLE team, or um, email any one of us to ask us any questions that we did not answer for you on today's webinar. Thank you again. Thank you.